right, it's one, let's go. Uh, so hello everyone, thank you for attending the sixth session of the Tour de France series from A to Z. Um, so all the previous sessions have been adding to the uh, YouTube channel of the Princeton Public Library, so you can uh, watch the previous sessions if you want to. Uh, and this one is going to be recorded as well and will be uploaded on YouTube in just a few days. So I'm very excited today uh, to talk to you about three more cities, Orléans, Paris, and Quimper. And so we'll start with Orléans without further, further ado. So Orléans is located, located about 70 miles southwest of Paris, uh, which is, let me add more people, all right. So Paris is actually located over here. So like, it's like quite close from Paris. Uh, it's a mid-sized city with about 117,000 inhabitants. Uh, and it's located on the Loire River. So Orléans actually was the capital of the Kingdom of France in the fifth century. And one of its most emblematic figures is Joan of Arc, who uh, on May 8th, 1429, led the French army and beat the English who had besieged the city. So that was during the Hundred Years War. And uh, there are actually a lot of statues of Joan of Arc uh, across the city. So, as you can imagine, the city of New Orleans in the U.S. actually takes its name from the city of Orléans. And that's because uh, when the French founded the city in the early 18th century, I'm talking about New Orleans, uh, the Duke of Orléans was the King Regent of France, and the colony gave the city that name in his honor. So what can you do when you are in Orléans? So first, I would advise you to go to the Cathedral of the Holy Cross of Orléans, which is a Gothic cathedral about 375 feet high. Uh, so this cathedral was built between 1287 and was um, finished in 1829, so over six centuries, which was quite which is quite long. Uh, so it was officially inaugurated actually on May 8th, 1829, so exactly 400 years after Joan of Arc liberated the city of Orléans. So it took that long to uh, build this cathedral uh, because of various wars and because various wars and events uh, delayed, its, delayed sorry, its completion. Um, and even after it was completed, it was damaged by other walls like and, and conflicts. For example, it was partially damaged during World War II. Uh, so you can, uh, if you want, climb the 252 steps uh, to have a panoramic view over the city. So you would be about there. And from there, you would have quite a nice view over the city of Orléans and the Loire. Uh, inside the cathedral, you can find 10 glass windows that tell the story of Joan of Arc, like this one. Uh, so Joan of Arc actually went to the cathedral when it was not done at the time, obviously. Uh, and she went there to pray uh, during the siege uh, of the city of Orléans by the English. After the cathedral, you can aim to the Parc Floral de la Source, which literally means uh, Spring Floral Park. So it's a 86.5 acre recreational park, and it gets its name from the fact uh, that in the park you can find the spring of the Loiret, uh, which is one of the Loire's affluents. So in this park, you can find nine flower gardens dedicated to specific species uh, or atmosphere. Like for example, there's a rose garden, an iris garden, a dahlia garden, lots of flowers. Um, there have some, they have some animals as well, um, like flamingos. Um, they have different species of parakeets as well. Uh, there's a butterfly greenhouse and they have a little farm with uh, animals like donkeys, tiny goats, sheep, and pigs. And uh, it's also an art space as you can find many sculptures across the park. So the building that you can see over here, you can't actually visit it because it's part of the uh, University of Orléans, but it used to be a castle. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing more about Joan of Arc, you can go to the Joan of Arc's house, which is a history museum dedicated to the life of Joan of Arc and her time. 
So uh, the current house is actually not the original one because it was destroyed during World War II. So the reconstitution dates from 1965. Uh, so Joan of Arc stayed in the original house for a few weeks during the siege of Orléans in 1429. She was hosted by the king's treasurer uh, named Jacques Boucher. Uh, so the museum of uh, this museum hosts as well as a center of research and documentation with more than 30,000 items uh, about uh, Joan of Arc's life and uh, her time, the 100 years war, Middle Ages, and the society at the time. Uh, so the life of Joan of Arc has inspired many, many, many books and movies, like, for example, uh, the movie Joan of Arc, uh, directed by Victor Fleming and was released in 1948, the one with Ingrid Berman, uh, The Messenger by Luc Besson in 1999 with Mila Jovovic as Joan of Arc, and recently there's a book that has been published in 2022, wrote by Catherine J. Chen, named, titled Joan. Uh, all those resources are available at the library if you want to check them out. And while in Orléans, you can take a car and drive to Chambord Castle, which was built between 1519 uh, and 1547. So during the first, uh, the very first session, I talked to you about a few of the Loire Valley castles. And this one, the Chambord Castle, is actually the largest one uh, that you can find uh, in the Loire Valley. Uh, so the building itself is quite huge, and the estate as well uh, is very big, as it comprises a forest. So uh, the whole estate is approx uh, approximately 13,500 uh, uh, acre area. Uh, so it was uh, the King François Ier's hosting lodge, and so uh, the king, <clears throat> sorry, so the king had it built uh, to um, celebrate his own glory, let's say. And so what's funny is that over his thirty-two year uh, reign, he stayed at this castle for only forty-two days. So it was not really a castle where he lived all year round, obviously, but yeah, this was more a spot where he went to and like wanted to hunt in the forest. Um, so uh, after him, a lot of uh, kings and other no nobles actually uh, passed by the Chambord Castle and stayed, like for example, Louis XIV, Louis XV, and actually, Molière showed his uh, play The Bourgeois Gentilhomme for the first time in Chambord in front of Louis XIV's court in 1670. So uh, one of the most uh, incredible features that you can find in the Chambord castle is actually a double revolution staircase, uh, which design is uh, inspired by uh, Leonardo da Vinci's. Uh, so it's, uh, I will show you a picture actually. Uh, I, okay, I will just show it to you later. So uh, for the moment, you can imagine actually two stairs facing each other. And it's a bit like DNA, actually. They kind of uh, turn around without uh, ever crossing one another. Um, so it's it was quite an incredible design. Uh, so uh, in this castle, there are a lot of spaces that you can visit. So the terraces, the royal dwellings, uh, some bedrooms, uh, and so on, so kitchens, vineyards, French and vegetable gardens, as well as the stables. And if you are visiting the castle between April and November, you may have the chance to uh, see a horse and bird of prey show in, uh, in the castle. Well, not directly in the building, but like uh, close to the stables, I think. So here you have uh, on this picture, Louis XIV ceremonial bedroom. And so, yeah, this is the double uh, revolution staircase, which was uh, a very uh, impressive uh, architectural design uh, in the Renaissance. So uh, the uh, Chambord Castle is actually on the UNESCO World Heritage List uh, since 1981. And uh, actually guided tours are offered in English in the Chambord Castle, which is nice, which doesn't happen all the time. 
so Orléans offers a few festivals all year round, starting with the Fête Joannique d'Orléans. Uh, this festival happens late April to early May, about 10 days, uh, and this festival celebrates Joan of Arc. So this festival is actually part of the UNESCO's inventory of intangible cultural heritage since 2018. And uh, those celebrations are actually among the oldest festivities in the country. So during this, this festival, you can attend parades, uh, medieval market, there's as well a sound and light show on the cathedral facade, a DJ sets and concerts. So the uh, epitome of the of this uh, festival is on May 8th to celebrate the birthday of the liberation of the city of Orléans. Then you can go to O Tempo Festival, which is a new music festival created in 2021. It lasts for about three days uh, and is at the end of August. Uh, so not directly in Orléans, but in a city nearby. The festival Hop Up Up is a two day music festival in the city center of Orléans that usually happens mid September. And for the Festival de Loire, so this one happens every other year uh, on even years. It lasts for about five days at the end of September. And so if you go there, you will uh, participate in uh, activities, uh, workshops and animations related to river transportations. So uh, every year the festival happens, there are more than 200 boats that gather in the old ports 700 sailors and hundreds of artists who showcase their arts and know-how. Know uh, you, uh, you can also attend uh, regattas, rowing races. You can go for a boat ride, uh, attend some shows, see some fireworks. Uh, there's also a lot of um, music performances in the streets and on the waterfront, as well as food tasting. So talking about food, what can you eat in Orléans? So first, uh, Orléans vinegar is uh, quite famous. Uh, so the tradition of making vinegar in Orléans is very old, as it dates from the Middle Ages, uh, when wine was transported by boat on the Loire and tended to turn bad. So some artisans uh, transformed the wine into vinegar by natural fermentation of different wines in an oak barrel without adding uh, any uh, bacteria. And so Martin Pouret is a company uh, so the, the one on this picture. Uh, so this company was actually founded at the end of the 18th century and is still active in the production of vinegar. You can try some cotignac as well, which is a quince jelly. Uh, apparently it was already made centuries ago and was recommended by doctors to use as medication in the 17th century. I'm not so sure that it was, actually efficient as a cure, but at least it was sweet, so I guess it couldn't really hurt. Olivier André is a cow cheese uh, preserved in ashes that makes its crust. And the tartatin that you probably heard of uh, was actually created accidentally in the 1880s at the Hotel Tatin by Stephanie and Caroline Tatin in a village located 30 minutes away from Orléans. Uh, so yeah, for uh, those who never uh, tasted or heard of tartatin, basically it's an upside down apple pie. Then I guess the one that you expected the most of the whole sessions, so Paris. So uh, I decided to take a, a different format, I would say, for Paris, because I guess that you know uh, a few things about the city already. So of course, it's the capital of France, of luxury, haute couture, and haute gastronomy. Uh, and every year, actually, the actual Tour de France ends in Paris on the Avenue des Champs Élysées. Uh, so I myself lived in Paris for four years when I was a student from 2010 uh, to, yes, 2014. Exactly, yes, 2014. And I always enjoy going back there and just like being a tourist in Paris. So like, yeah, what I'm going to offer you is my own version of Emily in Paris actually when it comes to the point of interest. So uh, my selection will be very biased and will be uh, basically based on my own preferences. 
but of course, if you want uh, to ask me more questions about things that I haven't talked about, please feel free to ask them at the, the end of the session. But first, I want to try your knowledge about Paris. So here you go for a little quiz. So you can answer the question either by unmuting yourself or uh, typing it on the chat. So um, first, why is Paris called the City of Light? Answer A, because of the Eiffel Tower, which is illuminated at night. B, because of the Enlightenment movement in the 18th century. Or C, because it was among the first cities to have public lighting. Okay, I see a little bit of all the answers. And the right one was answer C, because it was among the first cities to have public lighting. So it's actually dates from as far as the 17th century. Uh, so it was the, uh, yeah, so it was under Louis XIV in 1665, uh, where the first, very first attempt of uh, offer uh, public lighting uh made with at the time lanterns so it was for a very practical reason because at this uh at this time paris uh, was not very safe so there were a lot of burglaries and a lot of murders as well so to feel safer with the 14th order that the city would be uh illuminated at night to avoid any crimes Second question, like Lyon and Marseille, Paris is divided into arrondissements that you can call districts as well. How many are there in Paris? All right, I see a few answers. So it's more than that. Yeah, it's actually 20. Well done, Sadana. So yes, so the city of Paris has 20 arrondissements and they are organized as a snail actually. So as you can see, uh, if you can read Roman uh, numbers, so the first one is at the very cent city center and then like a snail, it actually goes all around. And so, so the um, uh, Vincennes Park and the Boulogne Park are part of the city of Paris as well. As well. So like I, they gave the city a kind of weird shape, but like yeah, for most of the city, it's just like a, a huge snail. Third question. What was the most visited site in Paris in 2022? So A, the Eiffel Tower, B, the Sacré-Cœur Basilica, or C, the Louvre Museum. The 2022 precision in that case is, is quite important. ACA. All right. So actually, the correct answer is the Sacré Cœur Basilica. Uh, so, but before 2022, and actually before it's partially burnt, um, so it used to be Notre Dame de Paris. That was the most visited site with about 12 visitors per year. So Notre Dame de Paris is still closed for now, but hopefully it will reopen at the end of 2024. Uh, so to give you an idea, the Sacred Heart, Sacré Cœur Basilica, there are about 20, 10 million people who visited it in 2022. As for the Museum of the Louvre, it was 7.7 .7 million and the Eiffel Tower was 5.8 million. And last question, how many tourists do you think go to Paris each year? Pre-pandemic average, I would say. So A, 10 million, B, 30 million, C, about 60 million. CCB. So the answer is 30, about 30 million uh, tourists 
uh, visit Paris each year. Uh, so there were about 33 million in 2017, 38 million in 2019. So to um, give you a perspective, 30 million represents about half of the entire population of France. So that's, uh, so this number 30 million uh, in, uh, sorry, represent both actually um, French tourists and international tourists. And most of the international tourists actually come from the US. So my favorite points of interest that you should visit while you are in Paris. The first one is the Orsay Museum. It's my absolute favorite museum in Paris uh, because it has the biggest impressionist and post-impressionist painting collection in the world. I'm a huge fan of Monet and I really like Van Gogh and like yeah, they have a lot of uh, Manet as well, Suzanne, Degas, you name them. Uh, so yes, if you like impressionists, that's definitely an awesome destination for you. So overall, uh, they have more than 450 impressionist painting and more than 600 post impressionist paintings. So the whole museum uh, showcases Western artistic creation from 1848 to 1914. And overall, the collection has more than 150,000 works. So from uh, paintings, like yeah, 5,000 paintings, all style together, uh, 2,000 sculpture, 45,000 photographs, about 1,500 drawings, uh, so like yeah, their collection is really huge and they offer um, a lot of temporary exhibitions as well uh, of uh, artists and uh, theme and paintings that were created between 1848 to 1914. So the building itself is actually very beautiful and interesting because it used to be a train station. And this train station was inaugurated at the 1900 Universal Ex Exposition the same year as the, the Eiffel Tower was uh, revealed, uh, so at the same Universal Exposition. And so uh, the building was repurposed as a museum in 1986. So I mentioned it just a bit earlier, uh, the Sacred Heart Basilica uh, is located on the 18th arrondissement, so in the north of Paris, at the top of Montmartre Hill. So it's not really a neighborhood that I went to often. And I have to say that I, so I went to Montmartre as a, as a tourist, mostly after actually I, I've lived in Paris for four years because it was on the other side of the, of the Seine. And when I was a student, I was hanging out more on the, the left bank, in the south of Paris, but I really enjoyed just like walking in Montmartre uh, later. Uh, so this basilica was built between 1875 and 1923. So if you remember, if you attended last session, actually, I talked about the uh, basilica of Notre Dame de la Garde in Marseille and the Notre Dame de Fourvière Basilica in Lyon. So those three with the Sacred Heart Basilica, they present the same style, which is Neo-Byzantine. Uh, so you can see it from the, the, the domes over here. So this is really like a, a Byzant like a feature of the Byzantine architecture. So overall, it's about 83 meter high, and it was designed by architect, architect Paul Abadi, who unfortunately died before the Sacred Heart Basilica was completed. And overall, there are six architects who actually uh, uh, oversaw the, the completion of the Sacred Heart Basilica. Uh, so what I haven't mentioned earlier is that the Montmartre Hill is actually the highest um, the highest point of Paris. So from there, uh, you, it's like yeah, the, the Sacred Heart Basilica is actually the culminating point in Paris. And from there, if you climb the 273, sorry, 237 steps that led to the uh, galleries over there, you can have a fantastic view over Paris. It's even better when the weather is nice, but even when it's gray, it's really not so bad. Um, so inside of the, of the basilica, you can see a huge mosaic that's, um, <clears throat> that's about uh, 5,000 uh, square feet. 
entitled The Triumph of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And uh, so it's actually one of the largest mosaics in the world. And so this is the view that you can have from uh, the, the gallery at the top of the Sacred Heart Basilica. So it actually, uh, so like it uh, received the historical monument designation on December 8th, 2022. And so, yes, as I mentioned, uh, so I didn't mention it earlier, sorry, but Montmartre overall, like if you go to the Sacred Heart Basilica, it's really worth it to just like wander in the uh, small streets of Montmartre, which is a bit less right now, but like historically it was the Bohème and artsy neighborhood uh, where actually, uh, which was basically uh, the, the center of modern art at the the eighth of the 19th century and the uh, early 20th century. So like yeah, Montmartre was really at the center of that, um, that um, I would say very important uh, period for arts. So Toulouse, Lautrec, Degas, Picasso, Modigliani, Van Gogh, Pissarro, Auguste Renoir. So all those painters uh, either lived or uh, worked there as painters. Uh, either outdoor or in their studio or uh, in the streets. And so the Montmartre neighborhood still uh, has that artsy vibe. Just behind actually the Sacred Heart Basilica, there's a, a kind of a plaza, a square, where you still have a lot of painters who just like sell their arts um, on, the, on the plaza. Uh, and just like paint live in front of you. It's, uh, if you saw the movie actually, uh, so this is where most of the intrigue of the movie Amélie uh, takes, takes place. So not Emily, but Amélie. Uh, then a place that I absolutely love is the Père Lachaise Cemetery. So it's actually really not creepy to uh, wander in uh, Cemetery's Alley. This one is really beautiful. I loved going there. Of course, it's peaceful and quiet, but it's also very interesting to just like see the evolution of the, the art of the tomb, uh, like century, like year after year, decades after decades. So this cemetery is located in the 20th arrondissement in the east of Paris. Uh, it opened in 1804, and it's the biggest cemetery in Paris. It's about 100 acres, and there are more than 70,000 burial, burial plots in this cemetery. So overall, it follows um, like the English-style uh, garden. Uh, so for its um, uh, layout, I would say so. Like, yeah, it's not like. Uh, in Versailles, for example, where everything is like really square, like very well shaped, you know, like it's more nature does its job and like whatever grows, grows and, and that's it. And so all funerary star styles are represented in this cemetery, from Gothic graves to Haussmannian burial chambers, ancient mausoleums. Uh, so like, yes, it's, it's very, very interesting to just like see all those different styles one next to each other. And it's actually the most visited cemetery in the world with more than 3 million visitors per year. And you may know that actually a lot of stars and artists are buried in that cemetery, French artists, but also uh, foreign artists. So among the um, most famous people, so for writers, uh, so sorry, for uh, singers, uh, you have so Edith Piaf, Jim Morrison, Frédéric Chopin, Yves Montand, uh, writers, so Molière is buried over there, as well as Balzac, Marcel Proust, Oscar Wilde, Gert Gertrude Stein as well is buried in the Père Lachaise Cemetery. And as for painters and other artists, so Pissarro, Modigliani, Georges Méliès, Ingres, Jericho, Delacroix, and many more. And so people are still buried over there. Uh, so I think the only condition is that you have to have lived in Paris for uh, quite a few years and to have died in Paris. 
So this is a description of the Père Lachaise uh, Cemetery from Sentimental Education, written by Gustave Flaubert and published in 1869. The tombs among the trees, broken columns, pyramids, temples, dolmens, obelisks, and Etrus Etruscan vaults with doors of bronze. In some of them might be seen funeral boudoir, so to speak, with rustic armchairs and folding stools. Spider's web hung like rags from the little chains of the, of the urns. And the bouquet of satin ribbons and the cru crucifixes were covered with dust. Everywhere, between the balusters on the tombstone, may be observed crowns of immortal and chandeliers, vases, flowers, black discs set off with gold letters and plastered statuettes. statuettes. Little boys or little girls or little angels sustained in the air by brass wires. Several of them have even a roof of zinc overhead. Huge cables made of glass strung together, black, white, or azure, descend from the tops of the monuments to the end of the flagstones with long folds like boas. The rays of the sun striking on them made them scintillate in the midst of the black wooden cr crosses. The hearse advanced along the broad path, which are paved like the streets of a city. And finally, something I really liked uh, doing while I was a student was actually walking from uh, Notre Dame to the Orsay Museum uh, along the Seine. Uh, so yeah, along the Seine River. Um, you can of course, go further, you can go to the other bank as well. So the Rive de Seine Park was actually created in 2017 uh, after, uh, so parts of the banks were redesigned and close to the car traffic to create a park accessible to pedestrians and cyclists. So it includes several segments on both sides of the bank. Uh, during the summer, the banks are turned into a beach resort called Paris Plage or Paris Beach. So over there you can play, chill, tan. Uh, there are some special amenities and games that are set that are set during the summer. It's still not possible to swim. Apparently, there's a project to cleanse the sand so that uh, athletes can swim in there during the 2024 Olympic Games uh, in Paris that will happen so like yeah, next year. Uh, and after that, they want to open it to the general public. If they manage to do that, that would be great. It's been a challenge for years and years and years to, to cleanse the sand. So if they can do it in a year, they would be actual champions. Um, or if you don't really want to walk, you can take the battle bus from Notre Dame to the Eiffel Tower. So the bateau bus has uh, nine stops to discover main monuments along the river. So from the uh, Orsay Museum to the Louvre Museum, uh, Notre Dame, and so like yeah, other stops as well. So it's actually a good way to discover the city and its monuments. So at least from, from the outside. So in uh, though the points of interest that I gave you, I did not mention the Eiffel Tower because I'm afraid of heights. And as much as I enjoy seeing it from far away, I don't want to climb on it because I'm really, really afraid of heights. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, Paris is a very vibrant city uh, that hosts many events and festivals uh, all year round, uh, especially music festivals. Uh, so usually when I was a student, I actually uh, went back to my parents' place in Angers to enjoy the summer. So I uh, unfortunately didn't go to uh, a lot of uh, summer festivals, but there's one that I really enjoyed, which is called Soli Days. Uh, so this one usually happens at the end of uh, the month of June, and it's a big music festival that's uh, run by a nonprofit organization called Solidarité Sida. Uh, in order to promote solidarity and raise awareness about AIDS. And it was its 25th anniversary this year. Uh, the Paris Summer Festival lasts for the whole month of July. So uh, if you go there, you can see some theater performances, dance performances, circus performances, uh, concerts, uh, plastic installations in well-known and unusual places in the capital, uh, even 
either in the open air or in um, like yeah uh, indoors but like not in traditional performance venues like for example uh, at the bottom of national monuments or in national monuments or churches or museums uh, Summer on the Canal is a festival that uh, takes place along the Ourc Canal in the 10th arrondissement uh, and in the north of Paris in July and August. So like yeah, uh, on the right bank of Paris. Uh, yeah, so in north side of Paris. So over there you can see, you can actually attend uh, concerts on some barges. You can take a cruise on the canal. You can walk around and see murals uh, in the area. You can as well participate in sports activities. And the Paris Fashion Week celebrates fashion and haute couture four weeks per year, two for men's wear and two for women's wear. So for the food, so yeah, <laughs> about Paris and the food in Paris. So one advice that I can give you is to uh, avoid tourist traps where food is not good and the waiters are not nice. It's not only a stereotype, it can actually happen. So like, yeah, the more, the more you can avoid highly touristic areas, the better you will eat, that's for sure. So I'm going to give you a few examples of uh, very typical dishes uh, that you can eat in Parisian bistros. Starting with the onion soup that I'm sure you heard about. So it's a very old dish that finds its origins during Roman antiquity when it was just a simple onion soup. And it was considered a dish of the poor as onions were growing very easily. It was improved in the 17th century with meat broth, bread crouton, and melted cheese, and today it's still served in restaurants and even in palaces, like with a like a very like uh, palaces with a very high reputation and like Michelin uh, starred restaurants. A croque monsieur is like literally a crunch gentleman, so it kind of looks like a grilled cheese in the sense that it's a hot sandwich made with ham and cheese, most of the time, Emmental, Comté, or Gruyère. It was invented in the 19th century and made popular in the early 20th century in bistros. And if you want to make it a croque madame, you just have to add an egg on the top. So the macaron <laughs> were created in the late 19th century uh, so it's made of sweet meringue. Uh, so yeah, it's made of sweet, sweet meringue. And between the meringue, you can uh, have uh, a filling either with jam or buttercream or ganache. Um, so like, yeah, Parisian macarons are like, yeah, different from other kinds of macarons that exist in France and in other countries, where in that case, it it's more like cookies and they don't have filling. So like, yeah, this is the, the epitome of like Parisian macarons that you can find at La Durée and many other bakeries. And the opera was, is a cake named after the Opéra Garnier. It was elaborated, uh, it's sorry, it's an elaborate almond sponge cake with a coffee and chocolate filling and icing. So it was created in 1955 by uh, Baker Syriac Gavillon, who worked very close from the Opéra Garnier. So last up for today is Quimper. So now we're going to Brittany. So Quimper is a middle-sized city, uh, which is as, uh, actually the historic uh, capital of uh, Cor the Cornouaille region. So you may have heard this name uh, because Cornouaille uh, was associated with the legend of King Arthur. And it's now one of the biggest cities in Finisterre. So Finisterre is the department at the very end of the west of France, which is about, yeah, that area over here. So the name Quimper uh, is derived from the Breton word Quimper, uh, which means confluence. So uh, the city of Quimper is actually crossed by several rivers, the main one being the Oder River, uh, as well as three of its affluents. And Breton language is actually still spoken in the area. There are about 200,000 speakers, mostly located in the Finisterre area. 
Uh, and Breton is very, very different from French. Like, yeah, the, the route is completely different as it was uh, and still is because it's uh, not an extinct language. Uh, so Breton is a Celtic language. So like, yeah, it sounds completely and like, yeah, the, the words have pretty much nothing in common uh, with French. Um, and so the city of Quimper is the hometown of poet and artist Max Jacob. And it's a city that's renowned for its faience uh, handicraft since the late 17th century. So one of the very uh, popular items from uh, the Quimper faience is actually the Breton bowl. Uh, so I have one, as you can see, this is, this is mine. Uh, I left it in my parents' place in Angers, but I still waiting for me in, in a corner of a, of a closet. Uh, so these kind of uh, bowls were designed since the 1930s. And so yeah, they are very popular, like a lot of people in France have them. So like, yeah, it's like quite a small bowl, about like, yeah, I would say this size with like two little handles. And at the bottom of the bowl, you will have a very typical Breton design. So either like, yeah, a woman or like uh, other characters with like, yeah, some very uh, traditional um, Breton costume. Uh, so while in Quimper, you can go to the Breton County Museum if you want to know more about Brittany and Finisterre. So this museum was created in 1846 and it's actually the oldest museum uh, in Finisterre. And it's focused on the history and cultural specificities of Finisterre. So overall, uh, so like, yes, this museum is actually located in the former Bishop's Palace of the city, which was built in the 16th century. And so in this museum, you can find more than 65,000 works and objects uh, like furniture, ceramics, costumes, paintings. Uh, so like yeah, um, paintings, for example, uh, depicting the life of Breton and like traditional uh, Breton costume and like yeah, furniture that was very, uh, that you can find very specifically in that area. And so apart from uh, seeing the collection of the museum, you can also visit uh, the rooms uh, of the former uh, Bishop's Palace, like the kitchens, the Bishop's suit, the Rohan Tower and staircase, a fresco room where you can find, <clears throat> where you can find uh, paintings on the walls from around the 1700s, as well as the cloisters from which you will have a view from the Saint Corentin Cathedral, which you can visit too if you want to. You can as well uh, take, a, take a trip to discover the Oder River. Um, so if you go to the north of Quimper, you can go to the Stangala Valley, uh, where the Oder River at that point is quite narrow and has a rapid flow, which make it quite a good spot for kayaking and rafting. And so the uh, Stangala Park, uh, which is about 200 acres, offers a lot of hiking and biking trails. If you go to the south uh, uh, of Quimper, on the other hand, so you can take a cruise from Quimper to Benodet, which is a, a city at the estuary of the Oder River that gives directly on the Atlantic Ocean. Sorry, so you can take a cruise along the castle route to discover castles and mansions that were built between the 18th and the early 20th century for uh, aristocrats, artists, and businessmen. And uh, along the way, you can uh, make a stop and go to the antique vestige at Le Perenou village, uh, where you will see Roman bath and a villa that were built in the first century, the, uh, very close to the river. So this is a view from the Stangala. So like, yeah, this view is more like, yeah, uh, of the other south of Quimper. Uh, oops. And this view is from the Stangala, so north of Quimper. So as you can see, uh, like, yeah, the flow is, uh, yeah, the river is way uh, more narrow and it's more rocky as well. So like, yeah, it's, it really makes it a, a good spot for, for kayaking and for hiking on the side as well. So uh, what I didn't say earlier is that uh, at some point, 
the valley is so steep that it's actually considered a canyon. And so this one is the Kerosian uh, castle that you can find along the castle routes if you take a cruise on the Oder River. Then uh, you can take a boat and go to the Glenon Archipelago, which is composed of seven main islets and many rocks of the south coast of Finisterre. So to go there, you can either take a boat from Benude, which is located over here, or Concarno or Fuenon, right there. So, <clears throat> sorry. So as you can see, the water is quite crystal clear. And so you could think that you are in the tropics, but no, 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 you are just of the coast of Brittany, a thousand, like thousands of kilometers away, of miles away from the tropics. So uh, the islands on the archipelago uh, offer quite a few uh, nautic activities like sailing, diving, kayaking. You can as well take a, a cruise like to just like explore the islands. And from there, uh, you, can, uh, you can discover the fauna and a bit of the flora as well of the, of the archipelago. Um, <clears throat> So it's uh, the archipelago is actually the habitat of the basking shark, which is inoffensive to humans. It, it's, I think, only kelp or plankton, maybe it's the same. Uh, and when you are walking on the island, you can maybe uh, spot some Glennon narcissus, which is a flower that grows only on the archipelago. So it's important to know as well that there are no hotels on the, the islands. So it's actually impossible to stay overnight. So when you go to the islands of Glenon, you actually have to uh, do a round trip during the day. And if you like nature, you can go to the Armoric Regional Natural Park, which is very large. Uh, it's about 300,000 acres and it encompasses 44 municipalities and about 65,000 people uh, live in that area. Uh, so it is divided into four territories. So first the island of the Irwasi, which we actually can see on the picture, I think they're located even further over there. The Crozon Peninsula over there, the Bay of Brest over here, and the Aremonts, uh, that you can see over there. Uh, so those uh, different territories offer very different aspects and landscapes. So from seaside to hills and moors, forests as well. <clears throat> and so overall, there are more than 500 kilometers or 300 miles of hiking path alongside some cycling and horseback riding path as well. Uh, if you want to know more about the uh, natural park, you can go to the Menemer Estate, which acts uh, a bit like an information center and uh, offers as well some uh, educational and playful activities to, dis to discover the park's ecosystem. Uh, so, for example, like you can know more about the wildlife, so the wolves, otters, weasels, buzzards, wood woodpeckers and salamanders that live in the park. Um, or you can know more as well about the domestic fauna and Breton breeds, like the Wesson sheep, which is very, very tiny. I think it's only uh, at most like 50 centimeters high. I can't remember what it's in inches, but I can find that for you. Um, so the Western white hog, the Pinwaco as well. And so um, around the information center, they have about 16 kilometers of walking path uh, in the Aremans, so in this area over there. Um, yeah. So yeah, here you have a, a glimpse of the different kind of landscapes that you can find in the Armoric Park. I've never been there myself, unfortunately. I've been to, I visited other parts of Brittany. Um, but yeah, the, the only time I went to Finisterre, unfortunately, I didn't have time to, to explore the area much, but it's really on my, on my bucket list. 
So um, <clears throat> Quimper and the Finistère offer uh, quite a few festivals as well. Breton people are known to like have the sense of party, I would say. Uh, so if you want to discover more uh, about the uh, Breton culture, you can definitely go to the Cornwall Festival. Uh, which is a one-week um, festival that usually happens mid-July in Quimper. So this festival is dedicated to the richness and diversity of Breton culture and was created in 20, 1923, sorry. So it's going to celebrate its 100th uh, birthday this year. So uh, during the festival, you can attend concerts, all kinds of entertainments like dance competitions. There's also a competition to determine the best bagadou, which means uh, backpipe player. There are bell ringers, dancers. Uh, there's also a great Sunday parade where everyone dresses in traditional costume, uh, which dates uh, from the 19th century, roughly. Uh, so like, yeah, this is some very traditional Breton costume. So for uh, women, um, so they have a kind of coif, so um, yeah, head uh, accessory, which is called a bigouden. Um, <clears throat> so like a yeah, high white, high white hat um, that you can see over here, like, yeah, this one is very traditional as well. It's a, it's a good example. Uh, and so, yeah, they have, uh, they were dressed as well with vivid colors and embroidery. And uh, as for the men, uh, so uh, yeah, they were colorful uh, waistcoats with embroidered patterns. So uh, by extension as well, so the Bigouden first was only uh, the name for the hat, but then tended to um, name the whole costume and even the, the women who wear that costume. Uh, so to go back to the other festivals, so the Festival du Beau du Monde across the world festival. Uh, so this one takes place in the Armoric Natural Park, uh, usually the first weekend of August, and it's a world music festival uh, that offers a very family atmosphere. Uh, the Filet Bleu, so Blue Fishing Nets Festival, was created in 1905, so over 100 years ago. Uh, this one happens every year, mid-August, and uh, it's located in Concarneau. Uh, so this festival is dedicated to fishery, its traditions and professions. Uh, over there, there's a costume parade as well with dancing and games, as well as performances, um, concerts. And the Sea Festival. Uh, so this one is a four day festival that happened in July every other year on the even years in Douarnenez. Uh, so not so far from Quimper. Uh, so for this festival, hundreds of sailing ships from all over the world gather in the ports. Uh, there are demonstrations of sailors' notes and other know-hows, uh, workshops, exhibitions, films devoted to sailings, concerts on the waterfront and on ships, performances in the streets, sailing initiation sessions, uh, and you can actually visit some of the ships as well. The next edition will be in 2024 with a focus on traditions from the 18th century, so both the Enlightenment and piracy. So what kind of things are in Britain? First, a very like yeah, the most traditional thing that you can try wherever you go in Brittany are crepe and galettes. Um, so crepe is actually uh, sweet. They are made with, with flour and the galettes are savory, made with buckwheat and wheat flours. You can fill them with uh, whatever you want. So for the savory, you can fill them with like eggs, ham, cheese, mushrooms, whatever suits you. Uh, same for the sweet ones. You can fill them with uh, jam, spreads, and my favorite, lemon sugar, just that. So simple, but so tasty and so good. So like, yeah, really whatever you like. Um, so for a typical Breton experience, you can try a crepe filled with salted butter caramel. That's really a must. Uh, so the device that you can see here uh, to make the crepe is actually called a billig. 
um, as well. So salted butter is very uh, used in Brittany. Uh, so like yeah, in the north of France, people tend to cook with uh, butter and in the south of France with oil. And in Brittany, it's like 100% salted butter. Like they use it every time for cooking and even for uh, sweet pastries. So the Queen Amman is uh, a cake that literally means butter cake in Breton. It's made of salted butter and sugar that are added to a bread dough. And it was invented in Douarnenez around 1865. I have to say that I'm very surprised that there are so many uh, bakeries and pastry shops in the area that uh, offer Queen Amman on their menu because I think it's quite difficult to, to make. I've never tried to make them, uh, but yeah, I, I'm happily surprised to see that it's so widespread uh, in the world. The Palais Breton is uh, so a kind of a sweet biscuit that was invented in 1920 by Alexis Le Villain, uh, who was a baker in the area. So it's basically a thick buttery biscuit, which is about one centimeter uh, large, so uh, 0 0.5 inch large. Uh, it's, it takes its name from a game that's very popular in the west of France, which consists in throwing a palais, so a puck, uh, on a wooden board. Uh, it's actually uh, very common where I come from too. So in, in Angers, I definitely played that game of just like throwing a throwing a puck on a, on a wooden board. And finally, the Far Breton. So it's basically a flan, uh, occasionally filled with pitted prunes uh, or raisins, or just flavored with rum. And to go with that, you can have a, oops, sorry. So you can have a, a little bowl of cider, uh, so cider and apple juice uh, are very, very popular in Brittany. Actually, 40% of the cider consumed in France is produced in Brittany, which makes it the second um, uh, region. Uh, so yeah, the second uh, area in France uh, that produces the, the highest amount of cider, the first one being uh, Normandy. So there are more than 600 different varieties of apple that uh, are cultivated in Brittany. So more than 600 uh, flavors of cider. Uh, there's actually a Cornwall cider roots. Um, so it's not a wine wood, but cider roots. So you can visit cideries and taste their products. And so yeah, the, the body is actually, so this little cup right here that you can, uh, so like, yeah, it's very, very common when you go to a, a traditional Breton crêperie to ask for cider when you eat a crepe. So this is the Cornwall cider root. So Quimper is over there. So like, yeah, as you can see, there are quite a few cideries on the road. So if you are, if you don't really like wine, but if you prefer cider, I guess you can go to Brittany and you would be very happy about the lot of different varieties of ciders that you can taste in the area. So that's it for today. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please uh, go ahead. You can ask them on the chat or mute yourself and I can try to answer them as best as I can. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, and so next week uh, we'll go to La Réunion Strasbourg, uh, so no sorry not next week, two, two weeks away from now, there will be a hiatus uh, on next week so like I yeah, see you in two weeks, uh, so the first week of August I think uh, to talk about La Réunion, Strasbourg and Toulouse and so yes if uh, you uh, don't think about anything to ask me now I'm always available at the library or by email. Uh, feel free to like yeah, email us and my colleagues will transmit your questions. And so, yeah, I'm always happy to, to answer your questions.
I'm happy that you had fun. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's it for today. So like, I see you in two weeks, guys. Have a good day.